to really a, a series that I want to do, and I'm going to do a series on the power of intercessory prayer. Uh, and I'm going to take some time and really uh, go, th go through it, really the dynamics of it, what the New Testament has to say about it, so that we get a revelation of really how God, if he's going to move in this, the earth, he moves through prayer. That is, you know, I've always said this, that God's kingdom is like a, a train. It is moving. But we lay the tracks through our prayer. And a train can only go as far as the tracks are laid. And so when we begin to lay the tracks by the Spirit of God and we are praying for others, then it releases God into our world, into our sphere of influence. Uh, you know why a lot of people are afraid to pray? You know why? They're afraid God won't answer. Can I tell you something also in the Scriptures? You will not find a chapter that is written on what you do if God doesn't answer prayers there's not the father hears you now there's an important thing about praying in faith if I'm going to pray for somebody after I finish praying for them I'm not I'm not going to go tell someone how ugly they are and how mean they are no you're going to stand in faith gosh I remember and you guys have heard this story about my mother but I remember a time I mean she has prayed and prayed and prayed and my twin brother and I, we were in the kitchen. We we're about to knock each other through the window. And my mom stood at the door. I remember this. She stood at the door, raised her hand, and said, Oh, thank you, Jesus. My kids just serve the Lord. You know, I'm, I, I'm about to pound my brother, and I'm looking at my mom, and she's going, Oh, we just worship. I just worship you, Jesus. My kids just love you. And I thought, She is a nut, you know. But. The thing was, you know what? She had fought that thing in the spirit that she knew she had victory. And uh, once we begin to pray, man, I tell you, you stand in victory and you stand in a heart of faith and you thank God that your prayers are being heard. Hebrews tells us, uh, it says in Hebrews chapter 1, it tells us that that the angels of the Lord are sent to those who shall be heirs of salvation. Let me tell you what, you, what happens when we pray for others. Angels, man, are being sent. I sat on an airplane one day flying back from California. And as I was sitting there, I had my Bible with me. And so I just sometimes I'll just take the Bible instead of reading the phone. And I just opened my Bible and I was reading, it was interesting because there was a seat in between me and a young lady. And the young girl, I'd say she's probably about 20, she, she looked over at me and she said, are you a pastor or minister? And I said, well, yes, I am. I said, but more than anything, I'm a believer. And she said, uh, you know, my grandmother, my grandmother's really been praying for me. That's what she said. And she said, you know, I've just, I went to church for a little while, but I just, man, I've just been out of it, been away from, you know, and I know, I know what to do. And she just started opening her heart to me, and so I let her share. And uh, she said to me, she said, my, my grandmother, she goes to this church. Um, they call it something like CARES, CARES. I said, charismatic? She said, yes. She said, man, they get pretty wild in there I kind of laughed I said yeah I said well you know that's kind of the church I go to and different things and I minister around the country and so she just kept talking so finally I said to her I said sweetheart I want to tell you something do you know why I'm sitting here beside you and she said why I said because of your grandmother's prayers the angels of the Lord set this up so that I could talk to you. And I said, normally I'll pull out my phone, but I had my Bible and I pulled out my Bible. 
And I want to I want to say this to you. God loves you. He is for you. The Lord wants, he's drawing you back in. This is why I'm here. And we talked, and she was like, you really believe that? I said, oh, absolutely. I said, that's the way the Lord works. And I'm here to tell you how much Jesus loves you. you got, you've got something to do for his kingdom. And before we landed, I had that kid's hand, and I mean, we were, we were really just getting her life right back with Jesus. Now, I want to tell you, God set me there for that purpose. He did. I got on an airplane one day coming from Chicago. A guy sits down beside me, and he said to me, he said, you probably don't know who I am. And I said, no. He said, I saw you in line. I know who you are. I asked the Lord for a miracle that I could sit beside you. And his ticket was right beside mine. And I said, well, we got a divine appointment. And he said, I've been praying. He started just sharing his heart about where he's at. He was in the middle of transition. And, you know, the Holy Spirit brought that together. So here, here's what God wants to do with you. Do not give up on your loved ones. Do not give up on those who you have on your heart. Do not stop praying. The more that you pray, the more the power of God is being released. And I don't care if it seems to be negative. The Holy Spirit is lining things up through our prayers and through our intercession to minister he will send people I, I have heard so many testimonies of people coming into a hotel room they were running away from God and all of a sudden they turned on the TV and there was a minister just preaching and they got captivated by it and before long they were in the floor weeping and crying and receiving Jesus as Lord the Holy Spirit knows how to do this I mean they'll just run into Christians everywhere they go they will God will just, he just, you know, he just stirs the pot. He just makes them miserable until they're like, man, I got, I, I've got to get my life right. I had a dear friend of mine, and it's, uh, I went to school with him in college, and we were together, and recently he's made contact with me. And uh, gosh, in high school, he was so away from God. He was on LSD walked off a water tower totally broke all his legs and all in, into his spine and everything else and they said he would never walk again and his mother had been interceding for him went into his bedroom and just simply laid a bible on his desk and there he was in that state cursing just mad at the world mad at God and everything else and he said one night I looked over there I could not get my eyes off that Bible and I and I was like I don't want I don't want to read that I don't want to because he he knew about the things of God and his mother had been praying for him and he grabbed that Bible and he began to read it and you know what God healed him man and just he's you he's a businessman and he and i've been been talking he uses the armor bearer in a church over in benton and god's just using him in all kinds of ways and he and i talked about that very thing what god did in his life i'm saying all this to tell you don't ever lose your hope and don't ever back off because the enemy, what he tries to do is come against your thoughts, come against your life because he doesn't want you praying. That's the thing he doesn't want. He doesn't mind you doing your Christian whatever. He doesn't, he doesn't care about that. But man, when you get on your knees and you start calling on the power of God because what happens, God is going to be released through our prayers and we know the scripture in, in second uh, chronicle seven fourteen. if my people who are called by my name shall do what humble themselves and pray and seek my face this is what god said i will hear from heaven i'm telling you, his ears are open hallelujah 
I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin, and I will heal heal their land. God wants to heal us, heal our family, heal this land, and it comes through God's people calling upon him. I really feel what the Holy Spirit is doing in the earth today. Just because, here's what you've got to understand. Just because there's a prophetic word doesn't mean that word's going to automatically come to pass. There are strong prophetic words about today and about what's going on. What we have to do is come in line with that prophetic word and begin to pray that prophetic word in the earth. And as we begin to pray, it releases. Because what does 2 Chronicles seven fourteen say? If my people. Well, what if, if my people don't if? Then guess what happens? God stands there and he's saying, someone asked me, here's the thing about the Holy Spirit, he's a gentleman. He will never go where he's not invited. And some people will never invite him in their life. And they don't want anything to do with him. So you know what we do? We just, we just put the invitation out for him. And he works and he ministers to them. The Bible is very clear. I mean, we are in some really radical days. There's going to be great things done. I was reading. Uh, I always stay pretty much up on Israel. Uh, I'll look at the Jerusalem Post. I'll look at other articles, is, is Israel Times, just to see what's happening. Because Israel's the time clock. And do you know right now, there's, there's something that's going on that's really fascinating. And that is Saudi Arabia and Israel behind the scenes are negotiating peace. And that's prophetic. There's going to be peace in Israel before the tribulation period, before anything happens. So we are living, and we're going to watch this happen in front of our eyes. But the glorious thing that when these things begin, begin to, come to come to pass, how many know Jesus is coming? Yeah, he's coming. And so in these times, what we are to pray, we're to pray what he has prophetically said. James said, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Hey, church, look at, look at Elijah. He prayed. He shut the heavens up. He got over here three years later and prayed, and the heavens opened. And he's not talking about physical rain. He's talking about the rain of the Holy Spirit, the manifestation of the Holy Ghost in the earth. So what is he saying to us? Let's kick our prayers into gear. I thank you, Lord. Let that spirit of Elijah come on me for the, the New Testament anointing of the Holy Spirit so that you can use me in the prayer that as I pray for others, because the more you fall in love with Jesus, the more you're going to fall in love with the world. You fall in love with people. So let me, let me lay some things out real quick. The power of intercession. Here's some beautiful quotes. Through prayer and intercession, you can rescue your children from disaster and pray them into the will of God. Absolutely. Through intercession, you can touch your community and impact your world, for God has placed all that he is and has at your disposal in prayer. I'm telling you, do you know that God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit lives inside your spirit? Amen. He is in you if you're born again. And I want everyone to know when you got born again, you didn't get a baby Holy Ghost. You got the full-grown Holy Ghost. And he's in you. And what, what we need to do is release him because he's the one who changes. We can't do it. In ourselves but he can intercession is the truly universal work for the Christian and I love this last one no place is closed to intercessory prayer no continent no nation no city no organization no office no power on earth can keep intercession out no greater power perspective for days uh, 
for days of, of pressure, intercessory prayer might be defined as loving our neighbor on our knees. Wow. Uh, Richard Wombrand, who in 1945, when World War II was over, the communists took over Romania, and he was a Romanian preacher. He was born again. And, uh, I mean, they literally said, you cannot preach the gospel. They were shutting it completely down. Well, he was not going to give up. Well, so they took him and they threw him in prison. Very, he, he started a ministry, Martyrs for Christ, or Tortured for Christ. Is that right, Kim? Tortured for Christ. And he really, he wrote a book called The Book of the Martyrs. And um, he was in prison and he said some of the most phenomenal things that God revealed to him. He said they told him, if you preach in prison, we're going to beat you. You cannot preach in prison. Well, I mean, he was preaching in prison. And he said, so they grabbed him and they would beat him. And this is what he said. He said, we were happy with the preaching. They were happy with the beating. So at least everybody was happy. That was his attitude. And then he said one day, he said, the anointing of God was on me. And he said, I was preaching to everyone on my cell block. I mean, he said, I was just, just ministering to them. And all of a sudden, he heard the guards coming. And they dragged him down and literally beat him and beat him and beat him. And they drug him back, threw him in the cell. When they walked off, he got up and he said, Now, brethren, where was I at before I was interrupted? <laughs> but he made the statement, which was absolutely incredible. He said, We were left in our cells. Now, he was, he's got marks all over his body. But he said, We were left in our cells. Sometimes they would put me in isolation. And he said... And I was there for days, months, had no clue. But he said, you know what? He said, you can change, you can chain the flesh, but you can't chain my spirit. That's what he said. And he said, and I began to cry to God for the nations. And I told the Lord, I will give myself to intercession. And he said that there was a night he was there and all of a sudden his spirit got lifted up he was with angels and the next thing you know he said I knew I was over different nations and my intercession he said I saw it as I was praying these angels were just moving into these nations and he said and and he said and I would come back he said I would dance all over that cell he said I had so much joy in my spirit and he he just made that statement over and over to a Christian, you might chain their flesh, but you can never chain their spirit. Hallelujah. Amen. And I want you to know Satan wants to chain you in your mind and in your flesh. He wants to shut you down because why? You know you're the light of the world. You're the light. Oh, Man, Jesus is the light. Yeah, but you know what he said? You're the light of the world. Don't hide your light under a bushel. No, you're to put it on a lampstand. Well, you can't do that by yourself. It takes the anointing. It takes a commitment to the Lord. Here's the scripture that we're basing this out of. This is the Amplified. I love the Amplified. James chapter 5, verse 16 through and 17. Confess to one another, therefore, your faults your slips, your false steps, your offenses, and your sins, and pray also for one another. In other words, what God is saying for us, for our prayer to be released, for our prayer to be pure, for God to move, we need to get all the junk out. And it doesn't take a long time to get the junk out. Any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away, all things have become new. I mean, ask God to forgive you and then begin to release your prayer, your intercession for others. He said, for one another that you may be healed and restored to a spiritual tone of mind and heart. Uh, 
the whole reason for that is you need to be tuned up in the spirit uh, the guitar up here I could go over there and turn all those knobs and I don't care you could bring the finest musician on the planet to play that guitar and guess what it's going to sound horrible why because it's out of tune and what the Lord wants us to do let's get ourselves in tune open our ears to what is happening in the earth know the season that we are in and listen to what the Holy Spirit is saying the earnest heartfelt continued everybody say that with me the earnest heartfelt continued look at your neighbor and say the earnest heartfelt continued so it's I'm not giving up I am continuing praying for my loved ones speaking the word praying in the spirit prayer for of a righteous man that that's what I love about the scripture you know you may have two or three and yes Jesus is in your presence and yes there one will put a thousand to flight two will put ten thousand to flight but if you don't have two to put ten thousand to flight bless God you can put a thousand to flight with your prayers and if you notice what the Lord is saying to you Elijah was the one who prayed and opened the heavens Elijah was the one who prayed and closed the heaven God didn't say okay Elijah just jump a little prayer real quick because I want to I want to close the heavens no Elijah one, one got down on his knees and said Israel's not serving God so let's just bring a famine maybe that'll get their attention that's the way he prayed God said all right let's shut it up and he said, here's the thing, rain wasn't coming until Elijah got down on his knees and prayed. Wow. You mean to tell me God's connected with our prayers? Yes. How many of you want rain in your home? You want the rain of God on your kids? Man, let's get back on our knees and let's begin to thank him. Listen, we're dealing with God here. We're dealing with God. He's omnipresent. He's, om, he's omniscient. He's omnipotent. He's all powerful, all knowing. He's everywhere. And we can release him in the earth. Earnest, heartfelt prayer of a righteous man makes tremendous power available. Notice that. Man, you are kicking into the power, and it's dynamic and it's working. Elijah was a human being with a nature such as we have with feelings, affections, just like ours. And he prayed earnestly for it not to rain, and no rain fell on the earth for three years and six months. And then the Bible says he prayed, and the heavens opened. So, Father, I thank you the heavens are opening over this place. It's opening all over all of central Arkansas. Oh, over Sherwood, North Little Rock. We just thank you, Father. We stand in faith. Thank you for pouring out your spirit upon the people and upon us in a new, fresh way. Keys to understand an intercessory prayer. Understand, here's where it all starts. You've got to have an understanding of the nature of God. You've got to know who God is. You've got to know that he is a good God. He's not up here... Uh, he didn't get up and decide, okay, let me send a hurricane to California this week. Uh, next week, I'll try to hit uh, over in Houston. Next week, we'll hit. No, that's not the Lord. The earth and the sin that is manifesting in the earth today because of the brokenness of men, it is bringing in the last days. It's, it's here. You've got so many prophetic signs and things that are coming so we're not to go hide and we're not to we're not to start jumping off the platform saying Jesus grab me rapture rapture no Jesus is going to come when he's ready what are we to do as the church man we need to be on our knees because you know what there's been a prophetic word that there's coming a a harvest that the world has never seen before and you and I are called to be a part of it. Amen? Amen? All right, here we go. 
First Timothy, I want you to notice this. First Timothy 2, uh, verses 1 through 4, I want you to see intercession is in the New Testament. Paul says this, Therefore I exhort first. Did he say second? Did he say third? What did he say? First. And he used the word exhort in the Greek. In the Greek, the word exhort would be just like this. Hey! Hey! Everybody, eyes, eyes toward me, put your phones down. Put every, everybody get quiet and listen to me. These are the words I am urging you to get a hold of. That's what the word exhort. And I mean he was telling Timothy, Timothy, hey, look at me. Eyeball to eyeball. Here it is. I urge you. This is important. You've got to get this in you. I exhort you that first you know what the word first means first that's it not second third fourth or fifth no i want you to get this i want the church to get this in their hearts and in their spirits i exhort first of all supplicate the word supplication is the word petition and in the in in the uh, structure of what Paul is saying the petition is not me petitioning something for me it's me petitioning something for you it's me calling your name out before the Lord and let me say this I'm telling you get yourself a list get a target list and just begin to speak the names of the people you're praying for and, and let that get into your consciousness while you're driving in a car you're just saying father thank you you're touching them right now i call their name out to you i thank you they have a call on their life you've got something you're revealing yourself to them and i thank you for it and i expect the power of god to move right now i don't care where they're at the thing about intercessory prayer it's what Richard Wombrand said it does not work by AT&T or Verizon it doesn't even need to hit a satellite I can right now father in the name of Jesus I lift up the brethren of abundant life school in Uganda Africa right now and you know what my prayer goes right there it is right there someone said man you know our prayers travel at the speed of light no that's way too slow they travel at the speed of thought everybody got that the moment the moment I can pray for Philip I don't know where Philip is God lays him on my heart whatever Father, right now in the name of Jesus, the wisdom of God, the grace of God, and the anointing of God is on him. I thank you the angels of the Lord are, are around him, protecting him, leading him, blessing him. And immediately, God is being released in his life. That's, that, that is why the whole, that's why Paul is saying, I exhort you, I exhort you. This is it. This is first in your life petition those that you are wanting God to touch petition the Lord for them and then he said move into prayers the word prayers what Paul is saying here in the Greek is me setting time aside for the supplication and the intercession I am going to move away from you guys and I'm going to pull myself and it is for me to pray for you it is for me to personally get into my prayer closet and begin to lift up people before God and begin to pray for this state begin to pray for however the Holy Spirit is directing and watch what he says here and the giving of thanks now he did that's that's what is a key to our intercession and our prayer and that is that with every intercession at the end of it, 
Hallelujah, you heard, Father. I thank you, you heard. And someone comes to you, did you hear the horrible thing that happened to them? Well, that may have happened, but I'll tell you what's about to happen. I'll tell you what's going to happen. Why? Because you've got it so much in your heart. And, and that's for you. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. And that's for several other people in here. Paul, the Spirit of God today, is saying, first, first petition me. Set aside prayer time. Intercessions, which is praying for others. And he said, don't do this without the giving of thanks before me. And notice the next three words. Made for who? For who? All men. Everybody say all men. So what does that mean? That means all men. That's the species of man. Everybody walking and talking. Before we start cursing people like, you know, good Lord, look at them, blah, 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 blah. Look what they do. Man, we need to start lifting them up saying, Father, you know what? It is your will to save that individual. And Lord, forgive me for just speaking negative and bad things about them. They get on my nerves, Lord, but you know that. So you know what? I'm going to give them to you. And I pray that you bless them in the name of Jesus. You, folks, you have the power to bless. You can walk in the schools. You can walk and say, before you ever go in there, I bless this house. I bless this office. I bless it with the anointing and the power of God. I release the Holy Spirit into this place. And watch how the Holy Spirit begins to work and, and, and move. Now watch this. For kings, notice this, for kings and for all who are in authority. So he said to number one, pray for all men. Intercede for everyone in your world of influence. And don't forget Pray for your leaders in this earth. How I many know they need God big time? And for those who are in authority, that's everyone in authority in your life. That's your government officials, that's your mom and dad, if you're young, whoever, your boss, everyone in authority. Lift them up. And notice here, because here's what God is saying, that we can lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. The goal is that the peace of God come in the life and in your world and especially those who you're in contact with. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. Now here we go. Who desires what? All men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Wow. And, you know, it, it takes a revelation to even get close to the heart of God for people who desires. You know what? That means pursues. It means passionately to pursue. God is passionately pursuing our loved ones and others. And it is his will that everyone be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. I'm going to make a statement here. God's love through the blood of Jesus has provided salvation for everyone. He longs for all mankind to be saved. Uh, we're in a time where we're going to see the salvation of mankind. We are going to see it happen before Jesus returns. Intercession, the word in the Greek is a go-between, to meet with in order to converse on behalf of others you've seen me do this jesus was an intercessor all, all what jesus did he stood in the gap god's up here man is down here in order for god to get back to man because man had broken the covenant with with god god sends jesus as a man he reaches up takes the hand of the father takes the hand of the world and through his intercession brings god into this world 
You know what you're doing when you petition the Lord for someone? You are taking the hand of that person and you're taking the, the hand and the power of the omnipotent God. The all-powerful, almighty is his name. And through your prayer, you're bringing him into their life. Wow. Can you understand why the devil doesn't want you to pray for people? Why he doesn't want you to pray for revival? Because he knows that he can stop the work of God, the move of God in the earth if the people aren't on their knees praying for God's grace to manifest. Now, I want you to watch the ministry of Jesus. Jesus today, I know we look, we, he died for us, he's a savior, he's a king. Does he still have a ministry today? Yes, he does. Hebrews seven twenty five. therefore, he is also able to save, get this, to the uttermost, those who come to God through him. Isn't that good? What do you mean the uttermost? That's the worst people on the planet. I mean, it just seemed like, you know, well, I tell you what, that person, good Lord, it'll be the grace of God if they get born again. And you know what it is by the grace of God. That's the meanest, ugliest person I've ever met in my life. Lord, they got every devil in the book on the inside of them. That's the way you feel. But you know what? Here, here is Jesus going. He is saying here, look, I paid the blood. I paid the price with my blood. I can save to the uttermost. I can say, do y'all understand the Apostle Paul? Gosh, before he became the Apostle Paul, he was Saul of Tarsus. He was dragging the Christians, I mean, into jail and into court and having them killed in the, in the middle of uh, all the, the Roman stuff they were doing, the gladiators and all this stuff. Man, these people were just being destroyed. That's what he was doing. But guess what? Somebody, the prayers of, of the Christian church and the prayers of the, of the other apostles for however, he held Stephen's coat and he watched Stephen cry out to Jesus and said, do not hold this sin to their charge. He saw that. I don't doubt it had an impact on his life. Because that's in chapter 8 of Acts. And by chapter 9, he is knocked off his horse. God knows how to knock people off their high horse. And I mean, the voice of Jesus came into his life, and then that was it. And it's interesting because he was, bl he was blinded of the light for three days. And Jesus basically said, you know, you're, you're, hey, Doc, you're kicking against me. You are persecuting me. And he, was, he had been taught the law. Gosh, he sat at the feet of Gamaliel. He had a Ph.D. in it. He was brilliant. And Jesus appeared and said, the one you're fighting is me. You're not, you're not defending the law. And man, he broke. And he spent three days blind. God speaks to a man, a, a disciple by the name of Ananias and tells him, Saul of Tarsus is over here. Now go over there and pray for him. I'm going to heal him. And Ananias was like, uh... You got the right address. I mean, there's something wrong here. I mean, uh, you, you know he's the one who is about, he, he drug my cousin away. He drug, he's drug everybody away. This guy is a bad dude. And God said, I know it, but I've got a great work for him to do. Guess what? God just saved to the uttermost. Go over there and pray for him. And Ananias goes, you know he was shaking. He's like, oh, I hope I've heard from God. He goes in there. There he is, blind. He tells Ananias the story. Ananias lays hands on him. He's healed, and his ministry begins. He writes two-thirds of the New Testament. 
Wow. Get ready. There's some uttermost. You might want to, when you put when you petition, write their name out, you might want to put underneath uttermost and grab this scripture. Since he always lives, notice this, he always lives to make intercession for men. Wow. I didn't know what Jesus was doing in heaven, but can I tell you what he's doing? He's making intercession. Here we go, Romans 8, 34. Who is he who condemns? It's not Christ who died, and furthermore, it's also, who's also risen, who is even, notice this, at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. You are a child of God. You are seated in heavenly places in Christ. Can I tell you something? God knows your name. Jesus knows your name. Jesus is before the Father, interceding, standing there. We have access to the Father through his name. This, uh, hang on for just one minute, I'll share the story. It won't, take just, it won't take long. This became so real to me, this scripture, became so alive to me, actually back in 19, really it was uh, 79, Kim and I got married in 77. I graduated from Southwestern Assembly of God Bible School. We both prayed. We felt like we were to go to Rama. We were in Rama. We were working. I was working at a shoe store. Kim was working as a the private sitter for, for the Bank of Oklahoma. They would hire her to go and, and work with elderly people. And so it's very interesting. <laughs> uh, as, as long as they were alive, she got paid. So she would go over there, get them born again, and they would die. They just did, you know. And I'm a, I'm, I'm in Rama. I'm running over there, going, "You'll live and not die in the name of Jesus." Because if they live, we get paid. So my motive probably wasn't very good, but man, I'm telling you, it was rough in those days. Gosh, man, we'd pay our tithe, we would, we would pay our bills, and. Oh, goodness, it was slim. And, and you know the story. We ate eggs one time for two weeks, just fried, poached, scrambled, you name it. We had them all because her aunt and her uncle at the time owned a chicken house or a chicken factory in Fayetteville, so they were sending us just dozen and dozen and dozen of eggs. So you open our refrigerator, nothing but eggs. So anyway, here's the story. We're about to get out of Rama. I had already told the boss that by faith, we were going into the ministry. I mean, we knew we were called. Uh, and he would ask me, he said, what are you going to do at the end of May? And I said, man, we're going in the ministry and this and that. So right about, it was about uh, around the 1st of May, he comes in and says, now, Terry, uh, I know you were planning on leaving the end of May. How many know I was saying that by faith? I mean, yeah. Oh, yeah, we're leaving. And I'm going, in the name of Jesus, we got a place to go. And he said, but my son's coming into business, so I'm releasing you at that time. And I said, okay. And then Kim, the lady she was working for, died. So she didn't have a job. I was losing my job, and we had no place to go. We had no ministry. Nobody knew who we were. You know, my dad owned the shoe store. I was raised selling shoes, and no one knew me. Had no contacts with anybody where ministry was concerned. And here I was, man. I'm 22 years old, and my whole world seems to be caving, just falling apart. And I, my mind was telling me, I mean, what am I going to do? The fact, even the thought of having to go to my parents and asking them, can we move in, that was just, I couldn't do it. I, there's, I, I wasn't going to do it. I was like, no way, I'm not doing that. I would never do that to them. And then plus, man, I just, I, I knew God had something greater for us. But I'm telling you, the pressure got on. And one day, I was in our little bedroom, one-bedroom apartment at 61st in Peoria in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And I fell on the floor, and I had a 
huge pity party. Anybody ever have a pity party? I mean, only one person shows up. But I did. I was just, God, all this, and just weeping and just breaking it. The Lord is so good in the middle of that. All of a sudden, I hear, Terry, why are you crying? Don't you realize I'm up here interceding for you? Wow. I'm telling you, that went off. I stood up. I dried it up, and I started dancing all over that apartment. Jesus is up there interceding for me. So how could I fail? Now, let me, sh let me sh share with you real quickly what happens and what God wants to do in your life. Nothing changed immediately, but about a week later, later, I was the church we were attending called Faith Christian Fellowship. At the time, it was one of the first charismatic Word of Faith churches that was birthed in Tulsa, and it was already running 2,000, 2, 2,500, and they would only seat about, really about 1,200. It was jammed and packed, and so if you know anything about me, uh, it would get so hot in there, it's just so ridiculous. So I would get there early because I was going to get an end seat right under an air-conditioned vent. You know, so, you know, you know the scripture. God walked with Adam in the cool of the day. So, I'm, I'm there. Kim wasn't with me. And I'm sitting. It's 30 minutes before service. They had dismissed the other service. I scooted in there real quick, grabbed my seat, had my Bible, just reading my Bible. And there was a family that was seated up front. And they were guests of the pastor and and a young man he gets up and he walk he's actually going to the bathroom as he's passing me he passed me and then he comes back and he and i'm reading and he he looks down at me and i look up at him and he says are you terry nance and i said well yes he said oh my goodness he said I happened to be in Magnolia, Arkansas last week. I met your parents, and she showed me your picture. This was before, this before cell phone. How many of you know you can't put stuff like that together? And so he said, you don't know this. My mother's right down there. Your grandmother, my dad's mom, was they, they lived in Hopeville, Arkansas, my grandfather and grandmother used to work for a family. They own a, uh, a lumber, they own all kinds of stuff down in Fordyce and in Hopeville. And my grandfather and grandmother worked for the family. They had a house on the property. And he told me, he said, your grandmother would, was a nanny to my mom. She loved your grandmother. And I never met my grandmother. She died, I think she was in her 40s, early 40s. She died of a brain aneurysm. So he said to me, he said, are you got any plans for lunch? I said, no. He said, well, why don't you go to lunch with us? So we went to lunch, and she began to share with me all about my grandmother and how the beautiful Christian and how she was and how much she loved her. She was like a second mom to her. And so it was really sweet to meet him and I didn't think anything about it well we get out of we get out of Rama and we had a meeting in Florida and so we we took off that was it we didn't know what we we're going to do so we get to Florida and we're on the way back and I said let's go to my mom and dad's for a few days and then we'll decide what we're going to do so the only thing I knew to do we only had like two hundred dollars in our pocket I said we'll go back to Tulsa See if we can't uh, pay whatever we can to keep the apartment and uh, grab jobs real quick. And that's what we were going to do. We got to the house, and I told my mom, I said, I'm going to go in the extra bedroom, and I'm going to fast and pray for the next 24 hours. And I was in that bedroom, and I was just praying in the Spirit. I was thanking the Lord. He had his hand on our lives. And the next morning... About 9 o'clock, I remember, right early in the morning, the phone rang to my parents' home. And my mom said, it's for you. And I said, okay. I go to the phone, 
And the young man I met three weeks ago at the church said, Terry, this is David, David Walters. I said, hey. He goes, man, I've been looking for you, trying to find you. He said, uh, there's a church that just got started in Little Rock called Agape, and, he, and they're looking for some people to work with. They need some help. And he said, the Lord just laid you and Kim on my heart. I just so strong. Y'all need to come up and meet them. It's uh, Happy and Jeannie Caldwell. And he said, D are you free this, you know, Friday night that you could come up and then Saturday stay over and go to church on Sunday? And I, I said, well, sure. I mean, no, I didn't need to look at my calendar. <laughs> you don't have to ask, is this God's will? You know, you ain't got nothing else to do. Just follow favor. And so we said, sure, we'll come up. And, and we, came, we came up. God begins to speak to our heart. The church just got started in West Little Rock. And uh, very interesting. I told the Lord, okay, we need X amount of dollars. If this is you, number one, I don't have an apartment. We need X amount of dollars to, to move. And I said, so you're going to have to show us. Well, you know what? That night in the service, Pastor Caldwell just got up and he said, you know, I feel directed by the Holy Spirit. We're supposed to receive an offering for Terry and Kim sounds like God to me <laughs> and you know what they handed me a check to the penny of what I told the Lord that we needed to move and then a family came up and said are you guys coming and we said we believe the Lord has sent us here and they said great we're renting you an apartment in West Little Rock Watergate Apartments. Now, this is back in, they were the elite at the time over in West Little Rock. I mean, they said, we've got it rented for six months. Y'all come on in here. Man, we shouted all the way to Tulsa, shouted all the way back, and started with nothing. But here's, here's, here's the thing. What did yeah, excellent. Isn't that great? <laughs> That's right. God is excellent. All right. I'm going to close it off with this right here. Y'all got something out of this today. Here, here's what I want you to know. Here's the bottom line. That's right. He ever liveth to make intercession for you. He is reminding the Father of the price that he paid for you. He's reminding the Father of the call he has placed on you. He is reminding the Father of all that he has done for you. He's reminding the Father of your place, your, your walk. He ever liveth. It's not just Terry and Kim that he's speaking. No, man. It is you, your name on his lips. And the minute we call upon him, it says he hears us and he will show us great and mighty things. Hallelujah. He has got your number today. And I believe the Holy Spirit, this week I pray, Father, speak to everyone in this place today. Show yourself in a new, fresh way in their life. You are interceding on their behalf, and they will not fail because of your grace. Hallelujah. All right, stand up. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord.